Welcome to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY Radio. A health promotion show brought to you by VIU nursing students. Over the next hour, we will be demystifying health issues. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, listeners. This week's show is all about exercise and nutrition. My name is Jaden, and in the studio today with me are Julia and Sophia. We are going to explore the benefits of activity and healthy eating, how you can help fit inactivity into your busy schedule, eating healthy on a budget, busting some common myths, and much more. Just a reminder that the information that we provide in the show is not meant as a substitution for medical advice from your physician or care provider. Up next, we have an interview with Ashley Rowe, winner of the 2014 Community Sport Hero Award here in Nanaimo. Founded in 2001, the Community Sport Hero Awards are an initiative of Sport BC that aims to recognize the leadership of BC's sport volunteers and their essential contribution to the delivery of sport programs in BC. Ashley, former head coach at the Nanaimo Canoe and Kayak Club, was recognized for her longtime commitment to developing the sport of canoe kayak in Nanaimo. So, hello. Um, Ashley, could you tell us a little bit about your background with sport? You bet. So, uh, my name is Ashley Rowe, and I think I'll start just by saying that when I was a young person, uh, my parents were great at involving us in parks and rec activities, so like dance classes. I was part of the local swim team in Prince Rupert for a few years, so that was kind of my introduction to sport. Um, When we moved here to Nanaimo, I became involved with the Canoe and Kayak Club, and that was just from a neighbor, you know, kind of mentioning that she was going to go kayaking with one of her friends, and I had nothing, you know, no previous background or information about the sport, but I thought that sounded like fun. And of course went down to the club, and there was lots of water, and friends, and young people, and Um, people in the water, on the water, and so for us that was, you know, for me that was a perfect fit. And then later on, you know, being involved with um, some school activities and things like that was really beneficial. The social aspects of being involved with community sport and recreation I think are are really kind of what have stuck with me. Um, Feeling physically fit and strong were also really strong motivators for me to continue participating in in those activities. Mm -hmm. Um, We had mentioned both from our backgrounds of running and paddling and swimming that that repetitive motion is really meditative and it's really nice to get out and just clear your mind and not have to think about, you know, um, the day-to-day activities. You can just kind of escape that. And so that was something that I really enjoyed about those particular sports. Um, I haven't had much experience with team sports, but um, certainly, you know, the, the aspects of swimming with the relays or with canoe kayak and doing doubles and um, like um, four person boats, mm-hmm. those were really were great opportunities to really develop that teamwork and sportsmanship like um, attitude, right? So um, in terms of my background after, after the community sport and recreation, um, it was really Incur- like I had a, a school counselor actually who was really um, encouraging and suggested that I look into the recreation administration program at Malaspina College mm-hmm. at the time because initially I was thinking be- about becoming a hairdresser and she was like <laughs> I think you'd be better suited for recreation administration with your background and so I left the hairstyle <laughs> business idea and um, went recreation and loved the program up there it was such a wonderful group of faculty and students that were involved in the program. It was very, uh, it was a fun program. Lots of theory and um, practical experience, um, fun activities. We had different classes like dance and, you know, Mm -hmm. outdoor recreation and leadership. And it was just a really nice group group of people to work with for those two years. And after I finished that program, I decided to go on and do my diploma in physical education because I, I really enjoyed that sport background. I'd done some coaching training as well, so I was wor- working with the, under the National Coaching Certification Program as a canoe kayak coach and instructor, and that was um, a wonderful experience working with young people and just sharing my background and love of the sport as well, mm-hmm. while still being involved myself as an athlete. And after doing my diploma in, in physical education, uh, I went, and kind of continued and followed on a path that I had started with doing instruction for sea kayaking. 
and guiding. And so that kind of took me down another, another pathway and led me into outdoor, outdoor tourism and ecotourism. And that led me down into Mexico and um, places in British Columbia here on the west coast of the island and also um, on the east coast in the Gulf Islands. Mm -hmm. Just really rewarding working with people and being outside and active and healthy, right? It was a really nice lifestyle. After doing that for close to five years, um, I came back and I completed my degree in recreation and tourism management and got involved, again, continuing with the coaching um, here locally at the Canoe Club and working with athletes. And I think one of the, the, real, the real encouraging and like, you know, thing that I feel really blessed with is working with all of those um, youth during that time of, you know, a lot of them are going through tough things with pre puberty or um, stresses at school or stresses in family. Um, they're starting to get to know their bodies. <clears throat> and having something where they can be physically active and have that social outlook, out, outlet where it's positive and it's inclusive and they feel like they have a bit of a community outside of their family and school was really important to me um, because I know for myself as a youth that was something that kind of kept me out of trouble yeah and so having those healthy healthy areas where they could go and and be physically active and um, come and just kind of leave all of that daily stuff that they didn't want to have to deal with for two hours mm -hmm. and just come and focus on themselves and perform and you know be, be active and fit was um, something really I, I had a lot of joy in and there were kids at the club that would come down that, you know, first first few times or even the first year where they had low self-esteem um, and really maybe low confidence as well in terms of what they had the ability to accomplish. And for a lot of these youth, being a part of something and feeling that they were, they belonged and that they were able to be physically active was really important. Um, and you could tell that they just started you know, they started building confidence because they were feeling stronger, they were feeling fitter, they were feeling mentally more positive. Um, we did a lot of variety in terms of our training too. We didn't just focus on paddling. So one of my philosophies was to, you know, to encourage a broad base of activities so that everyone had a chance to excel at something. Yeah. And, um, and just expose them to as much as possible because maybe, maybe paddling wasn't their like 100% like passion, but they were there because they liked their friends and things like that. So if we had lots of different activities, then we could, you know, kind of keep those kids involved in sport and activity and 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 the canoe club. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so that talks a lot about community um, sport and youth development. Um, in terms of kind of just more generally and broadly, the uh, positive effects psychologically and physiologically that activity and exercise can have. What do you think those might be? So for myself, just mm -hmm. using myself as an, as an example, um, I think the physiological benefits obviously are you do feel more fit, you feel stronger, you feel healthier, um, you've got more initiative and, and uh, just more motivation to, to continue on that healthy lifestyle track, right? So if you're being active and you're you're enjoying fitness, then probably you're going to think twice about eating something <laughs> that might put you off track, right? Yeah. Um, or drinking something like might put you off track. So um, that's something that's you know in terms of the physiological benefits. Um, a lot of people find that you know at first trying certain activities, of course they're going to have muscle soreness and things like that. But once you get you know, get past that stage, a lot of people really enjoy the sensation and even will enjoy feeling sore muscles because they know it's from activity and not from an injury or something like that. Yeah. Um, having that physical exertion also gives you um, a sense of relaxation afterwards. You feel mentally and physically relaxed and calm. Um, I was relating to somebody the other day who had gone up snowboarding and he spent the whole day up snowboarding and I remember myself going up skiing at times mm -hmm. and just being in the car on the drive home and feeling so relaxed like your muscles just feel so heavy and warm and relaxed and it's it's a really wonderful feeling it's it is a yeah, really great feeling yeah, to absolutely. have 
Um, and, you know, to have all of the toxins released at that time too, if you're sweating profusely, you're getting your heart rate up, it is a way to detoxify your body and just, you know, feel better about yourself. Um, the time in terms of your mental fitness and wellness, well-being, it's a chance for you to just reconnect with yourself and be in tune with that moment. If you're playing a soccer game, for instance, you're in tune with what your, your teammates are doing and in that particular game, you're not thinking about what you're making for dinner or what you had have for homework next week. It's just like a real mindful activity, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're mindful of what's going on and, and how you're involved. Um, a lot of people sleep better after they've had good exercise as well. Um, so that's another big plus for folks that maybe have trouble sleeping at night is getting out for fresh mm -hmm. air and getting their heart rate up and, and really having some good exercise. It can be therapy as well. So I know a lot of people use water as therapy. Uh, so getting, getting into the pool or when it's warmer into lakes mm -hmm. um, and ocean to, to use the water as resistance for those that might have muscle and joint problems. Uh, that's a nice way to still get their exercise and get involved and do some therapy. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, a lot of people, more and more so, they're doing uh, yoga, yoga, and I think a lot, of, a lot of it is. I mean, it's it's good physical exercise as well, but a lot of it, it kind of has meditative kind of quality about it. Do you think that other sports, running, swimming, paddling, they can have that same effect? I I believe they do from my own personal experience because. If you're doing an activity like those that are repetitive, mm -hmm. there's a chance for you to just kind of tune out to the rest of the world and be, you know, you're not you're not waiting for that pass for soccer or like someone throwing a basketball at you. You're not anticipating that um, really quick movement. Mm -hmm. So in swimming, running, biking, paddling, it is a repetitive motion and it is very easy to get in that meditative state um, because you're just you know it maybe for the first 10 minutes it's hard work <laughs> yeah 10 15 yeah. minutes but once you pass that we kind of call, call it like the threshold and you're you're kind of in like terminator mode where you just kind of feel like you can go forever and mm -hmm. it's um it's a really nice feeling it is great for for meditation and also for your respiration right those those activities that are more cardio based allow you to kind of jump into the that zone a bit easier Mm -hmm, mm hmm totally totally um, so we all given that we all have really really busy lives as students as parents um, even if we're just working it's um, really hard to find and fit in time to go and exercise or to play a sport do you have any suggestions about kind of how, how we can better incorporate activity into our lives I think one of the the best things that you could do is to set some goals up for yourself so if if it's weight loss you're looking for, if it's to improve your aerobic fitness, if it's to just get outside more with your kids, get your dogs out, like set, set a few goals and start simple so that you're not going to be let dip, letting yourself down if you can't accomplish it. So let's even just say, you know, I'm going to park farther away from my office or my school today and I'm going to walk an extra five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Just getting getting things started slowly is probably the best recommendation because then you're going to have a higher success rate and you're going to feel more positive rather than saying I'm going to start by doing an hour long run tomorrow <laughs> and get out there and after 10 minutes feel like you're going to die. Um, yeah. So so setting setting goals is really important and targeting them so that it's what you're looking to accomplish, right? So they always say that goals should be smart, so they're simple, they're measurable, they're achievable, and they're time-bound, and they're realistic, sorry, the R was in the wrong place. Um, so, so those are really important um, when you're making your, your goals, when yeah. you're setting goals. Uh, one of the other things is if you have someone else that shares similar goals, perhaps you could, you know, you could have them commit to doing one or two days a week with you and meeting you somewhere, um, whether it be at the gym or outside at one of the parks, um, to go in and do some activity together. Yeah. And maybe keep a little chart, right? It sounds silly, but even as adults, like if we write our things down, we feel more rewarded at the end of the week. If we see that we went out like three out of the four times that we were hoping to, well, give ourselves a small reward, you know? Yeah, Something that, yeah, absolutely. You, know, you know, maybe it's, 
maybe it's going out to the movie with our friend or you know we set up something that we something that's like a little treat or a reward for ourselves um, are really helpful something else is um, if you have a particular activity or sport that you like doing perhaps finding it in the leisure guide and just signing up for six weeks because a lot of the parks and rec sports and activities are short durations and you do it once a week um, so if you can commit to six weeks of just doing something for half an hour an hour um, that's kind of a nice way to start yeah. and you introduce yourself to other activities and things as well um, and sign up with a friend mm -hmm. if they've never tried that particular <laughs> um, sport or activity too it could, it's a nice way to kind of get involved yeah. and meet new people as well and people that have similar interests per perhaps and it helps being kind of a little bit more bound to it and then you have something that you're exactly. going to go and it's a it's a predetermined date and that's it's a, right yeah yeah so so that's those are some um, some things I can recommend uh, and and just keep yourself on track like keep keep little records and be realistic and and have rewards for yourself um, and based on your goals um, each week kind of check in and see how you best you know what steps you did to accomplish those goals even if it's just something really small mm -hmm. you know just write it down and be be proud of your be proud of your accomplishment awesome yeah. well thanks so much for taking the time and talking to me you're very welcome to thank you for asking me to be on the show thanks again to ashley for taking the time to talk with us up next mythbusters <laughs> Welcome to Mythbusters, the segment where we challenge common myths and misconceptions about health. Hey Julia, does being fit always mean that you're thin? Well, being fit means you have a strong and healthy heart, lungs, muscles, bones, and joints. Just because someone is thin or of a normal weight doesn't mean he or she can run a long distance or open a heavy door. Regular physical activity and balanced eating can help you stay at a healthy weight and prevent disease. Well, doesn't eating a lot of fat make you fat? Well, Julia, that's true and it's false. Well, fat itself doesn't create fat. Fat, whether it's margarine, olive oil, or butter, is a concentrated source of calories. If you eat a lot of fat in your diet, you're going to consume a lot of calories. And yes, that can make you gain weight. Before you ax fat from your diet, note that all fats aren't bad. Unsaturated fats, as well as omega-3 fatty acids, are essential for optimum health. And omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to lower the risk of heart disease and stroke. Health Canada recommends adults get 20 to 30 percent of their daily calories from healthy fats. So choose wisely. Your body will thank you. Hey, Julia, eggs are bad for your heart, right? Well, actually, eggs do contain a substantial amount of cholesterol in their yolks, about 211 milligrams per large egg. And yes, cholesterol is, a fat, is the fatty stuff in our blood that contributes to clogged arteries and heart attacks. But labeling eggs as bad for your heart is connecting the wrong dots. Epidemiologic studies show that most healthy people can eat an egg a day without problems. How? For most of us, the cholesterol we eat, in eggs or other food, doesn't have a huge impact on raising our blood cholesterol. The body simply compensates by manufacturing less cholesterol itself. The chief heart disease culprits are saturated and trans fats, which have much greater impact on raising blood cholesterol. Seen through that lens, eggs look more benign. A large egg contains two grams of saturated fats and no trans fats. But before you celebrate with a three egg omelet, consider the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation's diet and lifestyle recommendations. Well, I heard that all dark chocolate is good for you. It would be great if the only thing you had to do to eat healthy was grab a Snickers on your way to work. Unfortunately, the secret to unlocking the health benefits of chocolate are a bit more complicated than that. Plenty of studies have shown that polyphenols, which are the nutrients found in darkly colored plant foods like chocolate, can do everything from lowering your blood pressure to raising your ability to burn fat. A 2013 study in the Journal of Diabetic Medicine even found that eating dark chocolate lessened the effects of high blood sugar in diabetic patients. Unfortunately, the more chocolate is processed, the more of the polyphenols are lost, creating the Dutch chocolate, in which an alkalizing agent is added to the cocoa to reduce the acidity, destroys up to 77% of the nutrients in the cocoa. 
To get the health benefits that everyone talks about, look for a dark chocolate that says 70% cocoa or higher on the label. The rest, it's just candy. A lot of people have been sick lately, so I've been eating a lot of oranges because they're the best source for vitamin C. Well, vitamin C is great. Far more than a simple immune booster, vitamin C is an antioxidant that plays a host of important roles in your body. It strengthens skin by helping to build collagen, improves mood by increasing the flow of norepinephrine, and bolsters metabolic efficiency by helping transport fat cells into the body's energy-burning mitochondria. But since your body can neither store nor create the Wonder Vitamin, you need to provide a constant supply. An orange is the most famous vitamin C-rich food, and although it's a good source, it's by no means the best. For 70 calories, one orange gives you about 70 micrograms of vitamin C. Here are five sources with just as much vitamin C and even fewer calories. Papayas, Brussels sprouts, strawberries, broccoli, and red bell pepper all offer low-calorie substitutes. Well, multigrain and whole wheat breads are better than white. Wait a minute. Isn't multigrain way more nutritional? And haven't we been trained to pick the wheat bread over the white at every turn? Yes, but unfortunately, those labels aren't always as credible as we'd like. Wheat bread is generally white bread with caramel or molasses added to it to make it look dark and healthy. Multigrain often means that different kinds of refined grains may have been used, not necessarily nutritional ones. Look for the words 100% whole wheat or 100% whole grain on the package to ensure that you're making the healthiest choice. Now, as students, Julia, we love our coffee, but isn't it true that caffeine causes insomnia? Well, that really depends. The human body absorbs caffeine quickly, but it also flushes it out quickly. Processed mainly through the liver, caffeine has a relatively short half-life. On average, it takes four to five hours to rid half of the consumed caffeine in your body. After another five hours, 75% of it is eliminated. Unless you are very sensitive, a morning cup or two shouldn't affect your sleep. But if you have a quick latte at the three o'clock slump or an espresso after dinner, you may be awake for longer than you're comfortable with. Your sleep shouldn't be affected if you steer clear of caffeine for at least six hours before bedtime. Your sensitivity may vary. Your sensitivity may vary, though, depending on your metabolism and the amount of caffeine you regularly consume. Well, I've heard that drinking coffee makes you sober. Well, that would be really great. But in fact, not only does coffee have no sobering effects, it actually makes it harder for you to recognize that you're drunk. According to a study published in the Journal of Behavioral Neuroscience, the wakefulness and awareness boost that comes with caffeine intake can make you feel capable of driving home when you really aren't. Thomas Gold, the co-author of the study, explains to the American Psychological Association. The myth about coffee's sobering powers is particularly important to debunk because the co-use of caffeine and alcohol could actually lead to poor decisions with disastrous outcomes. People who have consumed only alcohol, who feel tired and intoxicated, may be more likely to acknowledge that they are drunk. Conversely, people who have consumed both alcohol and caffeine may feel awake and competent enough to handle potentially harmful situations, such as driving while intoxicated or placing themselves in dangerous social situations. So, what you can actually do to so uh. so what can you actually do to sober up? Drink water to keep yourself hydrated. Eat some food to help slow the absorption of alcohol, and wait it out. There's no magic elixir that will sober you up, and believing one exists is a potential danger to you and others. That's it for this week's MythBusters. And now for a musical interlude from Nanaimo's own Golden Shadow. This song is called Running Out of Room from their album Torch. And 
temper could just spoil the fun don't you think it's high time we got bitter and abusive for the winter in a way we've never known don't you think agreements to a fate or lesson our degree of vicious temper could just spoil If you're just tuning in now, you're listening to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY. That was Running Out of Room by Golden Shadow from their album Torch. For more information on the band or to purchase their album, you can visit their band camp page at Golden Shadow. Hey listeners, I was looking and found an excellent document from Food Banks Canada that outlined some really helpful tips and suggestions about eating healthy on a budget and navigating the grocery store so that you don't fall prey to some of their tricks to get you spending more. They suggest that many grocery stores have the same layout, with most packaged processed foods found in the middle aisles. To find whole foods like fruit, vegetables, milk, and meat, you'll want to stick mostly to the outer areas of the store. To fill a healthy shopping cart, they say that you should shop along the outer areas and buy more whole foods. In the frozen section, read the labels and choose items that contain more whole foods and less salt, sugar, and fats. Also interesting, because most people buy milk when they shop, it's kept along the back wall. This means that you end up having to pass by many tempting products on your way to the milk. Grocery store planners hope that you will buy a few other items while you're getting there. To help fight against this, they suggest to always bring a shopping list so that you're only buying what you really need. Some smart shopping tips they have include visit the reduced section at the back of the store. You'll find what-day-old bread and ripe fruit at discount prices. 
Using coupons is another w- great way to capitalize on any good deals or sales the grocery store might have on. They also recommend buying more when your favorite items are on sale. This works best for pantry items like pasta or foods you can freeze. Skipping the snack and soda pop aisle altogether, if you can, might also be helpful. These foods are not healthy or affordable. They also advise that you should chop. They also advise that you should chop foods yourself. Oftentimes, supermarkets will have pre-cut and washed fruits and veggies that actually cost more than their unprepared counterparts. For example, instead of buying a kilogram of pre-cut carrots for four dollars, you can buy three kilograms of whole carrots for like two dollars. In the produce aisles, you can save money by choosing items that are in season. Locally grown foods often cost less than imported items. Frozen vegetables and fruit are also a great idea. They won't rot, and they are pre-chopped for easy meals. Some best buys include fresh fruit in season, canned tomatoes, bananas, squash, and potatoes. When buying grain products, look for plain items with no added salt or fat. Buying when they're on sale is also a great way to go. Large bags of rolled oats instead of prepackaged single oatmeal portions are a good buy. Pop barley, rice, and store brand whole grain cereals are also great. For dairy products, look for larger containers that often cost less per serving. Just be sure that you can finish the contents before it expires. For example, larger tubs of yogurt instead of single portion containers. Also, buying large bricks of cheese, which cost a lot less than the packages of pre-shredded or strings cheese. When you go to buy meats and alternatives, you might find that less tender cuts of meat are more affordable, and they taste great when cooked slowly in stews, soups, or chili. Some great buys include stewing meat, whole chicken, as pre-cut chicken is more expensive. Dried peas, beans, and lentils are also good. They might take a little more preparation to cook, but cost a lot less than their canned counterparts. Canned tuna, peanut butter, and tofu are also good. They also had some great tips on do's and don'ts while you're at the grocery store. Sophia and I are going to share them with you. Do shop at discount grocery stores that offer reduced prices. Do eat before you go shopping. If you shop when you're hungry, you may be tempted to buy more than you need. Do check prices before buying bulk items. They're not always cheaper. Do read food labels. Choose items with 15% daily value or more for fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Do buy frozen fruits and vegetables. They're often cheaper than fresh, and they also won't spoil in your fridge. Don't shop on payday when you feel like you have a lot of money to spend. Don't buy canned in the checkout line. It's costly and often not healthy. Don't buy snack-sized items or single-serving products. Instead, buy a bigger package and divide it up yourself into smaller portions. Don't only buy groceries from the middle shelf. Scan the highest and the lowest shelves. The most expensive brands are kept at your eye level to trick you. Great deals can be found if you shop on upper and lower shelves. If you'd like to take a look at Food Bank Canada's tips or have any other questions, go check out our Facebook page at A Sound Constitution, where we post links to some of the content that we reference in the show, and where you can ask questions and tell us what you think. Up next, we have a video from Dr. Mike Evans, who specializes in preventative medicine, entitled "23 and a Half Hours." Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and welcome to this visual lecture. I'm calling "23 and a Half Hours." So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, Uh, weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What has the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? So I did my research and I I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, But I picked out this intervention and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems. And that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Postmenopausal woman who had four hours a week of the treatment had a 41% reduction in the risk of hip fracture. 
It reduced anxiety by 48% in a big meta-analysis. Patients suffering from depression, 30% were relieved uh, with low dose, and that bumped to 47% as we uh, increased the dose. Um, following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue. And of course, the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life, which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better. And this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm... Um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day so there's 24 hours and so you might spend most of your day you know this varies obviously but uh, you know couch surfing sitting at work obviously sleeping and what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active maybe an hour and that uh, if you can do that you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides. So let's just take a quick walk through some of the literature. So Stephen Blair uh, he's a professor at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina and he looked at this in what's called the aerobic center longitudinal study which followed over 50,000 men and women over time and uh, along the less left side of this graph is something called attributable fractions which is uh, a kind of fancy word but it's the estimate of the number of deaths in a population that would have been avoided if that specific risk factor had been erased so for example turning a smoker into a non-smoker or a couch potato into a daily walker and along the bottom is the typical risk factors. You can see the uh, hypertension is incredibly important and so on and so forth. But the one that was most, that kind of applied the most risk was this sort of mysterious CRF, which is cardiorespiratory fitness, which is really low fitness. So low fitness was the strongest predictor of death. And, and this is important that most of the trials we see, to be honest, are funded by uh, pharma or, or um, other companies because they've got a drug for hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes. And we rarely see fitness thrown into the mix. And so it's nice to see uh, a trial that's not so uh, siloed. I, I, Blair's work is interesting. He also did another uh, trial looking at um, uh, obesity. What he found was, you know, sort of two things. One is obesity and no exercise, that's a very bad combination. And that's where we saw many of the negative consequences of obesity from a health point of view. But if the if the obese person was active, even if they didn't have the weight loss, but were just active and obese, that was much, much better and that the that the exercise ameliorated much of the negative consequences of uh, obesity. Um, so if exercise is a medicine, what's a dose? So when I think of, of, of dose, I think of how long, how often, and how intense. I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message, but essentially uh, more activity is better. But I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more if you're a kid, an hour a day if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that... Um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush, uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something, and after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, woman who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down, so it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise, so it can be broken into three higher intensity. It looks like it's it's equivalent to less time with lower intensity. Uh, but I think uh, the, obviously the clinical pearl is mostly thinking about your, your style and habits and your personal cues. So if you're only going to do it if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve the 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs and so on and so forth. So thinking about that, I'm just going to walk you through some quick uh, slices of the literature. Uh, the first one comes from Japan. In, in, the, in the 90s, uh, Japan required all employers to conduct annual health screens for uh, their employees. And so a large gas company in Japan called Osaka uh, used this to answer a great question. Um, so if people's walk to work was longer, did that reduce their chance of serious health problems? So in this example, high blood pressure. And what they found is under 10-minute walk, no difference. 11 to 20-minute walk, 
12% reduction in rates of high blood pressure or hypertension. And over 21-minute walk, a 29% decrease in rates of high blood pressure. So uh, the authors calculated that for every increase of 10 minutes in your walk to work, there was a 12% reduction in the likelihood of getting high blood pressure. The second exhibit is uh, looking at stents. So this is something we commonly do down medicine. So you can see on the left here, the arteries blocked. On the right, a vascular surgeon has gone in and uh, put in a balloon, opened it up, and left a stent to keep it open, which makes great sense. So a German researcher named Reiner Hambrecht uh, looked at this with about 100 cardiac patients. He got half the group to exercise, and by that I mean 20 minutes a day on an exercise bicycle, and then once weekly, 60-minute aerobics class. And the other half got the high-tech stent and just their sort of normal activity. And after one year, 88% of the exercises were event-free compared to 70% of the people that got a stent. Um, so both worked, uh, but I find it you know, sort of incredible that the, uh, the low-tech uh, made a bigger difference. And you have to remember that the stent just fixes one part of the heart. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this, and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found, compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm just going to leave you with, uh, well, I guess, two quotes. So one is Jerry Garcia, the, the, the singer who is the lead singer for The Grateful Dead. And he said, somebody has to do something. It's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And I, I think that's true, that it, in some ways it has to be us. As Hippocrates said, uh, walking is man's best medicine. And so I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So something to think about. Thank you very much. If you're just tuning in now, you're listening to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY. That was a talk from Dr. Mike Evans entitled 23 and a Half Hours. Up next, we have fun facts with Sophia and Julia. And now for some fun facts about nutrition and exercise with Julia and Sophia. Did you know the Greeks and Romans regulated nutrition on the theory of the four humors circulating throughout the body, warm, cold, moist, and dry? Classical physicians tried to correct an excess of cold and moist humors by providing hot, dry foods and vice versa. For example, a woman's body was seen as wetter and colder than a man's, and therefore, she was to avoid food that would make her even colder and wetter, such as fish, eels, and meat from newborn animals. The Ebers Papyrus, 1350 BC, suggests placing drops of crushed and roasted ox liver in the eyes of people suffering from night blindness. While Egyptians most likely were not aware of vitamin A, liver does have high levels of this vitamin, which help maintain normal vision in dim light. Vitamin D is unusual because it's the only vitamin that can be synthesized in the body. Sunlight is the main source of vitamin D, though sunscreen lotions with high SPF can prevent vitamin D formation. Vitamin D is also the only vitamin that is a hormone. Did you know some children and pregnant women crave non-nutritive substances, such as paint, plaster, rocks, even dirt? These cravings may suggest that a person lacks certain minerals, such as iron. Improved nutrition, as well as vaccinations and antibiotics, has extended the average U.S. lifespan from 30 to 40 years old in the early 20th century to 70 to 80 years old today. Eggs are the food that contains the highest quality of protein known. Did you also know that all parts of the egg are edible, including the shell, which has a high calcium content? Regular exercise is linked to better sex because it can improve body image, energy, self-esteem, and overall fitness. It has also been reported that for some women, regular exercise can reduce signs and symptoms of PMS. Don't work out on an empty stomach. According to Shape.com, if you run out of energy during your workout, your body will start burning your muscle tissue, not your stored body fat. Also, add strength training to your cardio to speed up fat loss. Cardio alone can actually burn muscle tissue, 
and you need muscle tissue to burn fat even while you're at rest. That's it for this week's fun facts. Next up, we have a song for you. This is from Aidan Knight, a singer-songwriter from Victoria, and this is his original song, Jasper. to the water put my feet into it bathed my heels in jasper felt the sand give an inch all the people bathing teeth became connected smiling while we waited into the shallow nest take me When you put your face in the mouth of the canyon, the murky water tides. What a relief to see all your sins absolved without a washing cloth, just the stillness of the night. Take me down to the water. Hello, listeners. If you're just tuning in, this is A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY Radio. We just heard a song from Aiden Knight. You can check out his music on Bandcamp and iTunes. So what's the importance of good nutrition anyway? Well, science shows that eating well can make you more intelligent and successful. Sounds too good to be true? Here's a video from Discovery News highlighting how the food you eat affects your brain. Let me tell you how miserable my mornings are without breakfast. I hate everyone. Yes, everyone. Even that old lady who took the last seat on the train. I hate you. Hey guys, Julie here for D News. Do we need breakfast? I mean, your mom always tells you you need to eat it, but 
Do you really need to? A recent study published in the journal Public Economics says yes. The researchers found that schools that provided free breakfast for their students had better test scores than those that didn't. The kids performed 25% better in math and had similar gains in other areas like reading. But this news isn't entirely new. Breakfast is often heralded as the most important meal of the day, and science backs this up. There are loads of studies that show just how important it is for learning and memory, but it might not have the weight loss benefits you think. Anyways, is it breakfast that helps give your brain a boost, or is it the type of food you eat? I mean, the brain consumes a lot of energy. Almost 20% of the energy we consume goes to the brain. Some researchers say that the brain functions best when there's 25 grams of glucose circulating through the bloodstream. So really, you should keep that as level as possible. Any spike or dip can leave you feeling off. So maybe eating more frequent, smaller meals throughout the day can help you avoid a post-lunch crash. But is there a way to hack your brain with food? Is there such a thing as brain food? I mean, I was always told to eat a banana before a test. Curcumin and omega-3 seem to be buzzing around the blogosphere of late, and that may have some truth to it. According to a paper published in the National Review of Neuroscience, these nutrients lessen cognitive decline in the elderly and improve cognition in people with brain injuries. Your typical sources of omega-3 are in fish, like salmon, and in other things like flax seeds and walnuts. Curcumin can be found mostly in turmeric, a type of spice. Other nutrients, like iron and B vitamins, help memory and brain function in women, while diets high in saturated fats tend to do the opposite. Omega-3s and other micronutrients might be the heavy hitters of brain food. One study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that a cocktail of omega-3s, iron, zinc, folate, and vitamins A, B6, B12, and C helped kids in Australia and Indonesia do better on learning and memory tests. Another study published in the journal Appetite by some of the same researchers found that foods low on the glycemic index are better for breakfast. The glycemic index rates food based on how it affects your glucose levels or level of sugar. The study found that yes, kids' memory and cognitive function do decline throughout the morning, but a low GI breakfast reduced that decline more than a breakfast with a high GI. Low GI foods are like fruits and vegetables or maybe even oatmeal. So a good breakfast might be a bowl of oatmeal with a banana rather than a bowl of sugary cereal. So a balanced diet with fish and fruits and veggies seems to be good for the brain. Eating breakfast might keep you perkier in the morning, so you're more alert to learn more. And some studies even show that old wives' tale of chewing gum for a test is true. Chewing gum increases blood flow to the brain, which does all sorts of good things. So before a big test, eat a good breakfast, no not sugary cereals, and maybe have a piece of gum. What is your go-to test food? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, hit those like and subscribe buttons, and keep coming back here. We've got new episodes every day of the week. That was Julia Wilde helping us understand what the best diet is for your brain. So, now you know not to skip breakfast the next time you're rushing out the door. Some other great resources for nutritional facts and guidelines include Canada's Food Guide and the Dietitians of Canada's website at www.dietitians.ca. Some good news. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this week's Good News, where we talk about the exciting things happening in our community. When we looked into it, there were quite a few exciting things happening in the community related to nutrition and fitness. So we're going to talk about a few of them today. In Parksville, on March 18th and 19th, it is the 22nd annual Oceanside Family Health and Wellness Fair. Health professionals and exhibitors from across BC and Canada come together with information booths and seminars, tasting and sampling booths, new health product information, and more. For more information on sessions and seminars held, visit mycoastnow.com. I also spoke with a representative of the Tourism Management Program to talk about an exciting initiative they have coming up. So I'm here with Brianna Day, who is a first-year tourism management student, and she's going to talk about uh, an, initiative that, an initiative that her class has going on. Yeah, so the Recreation and Tourism Association is hosting a five-kilometer run around Westwood Lake on April 23rd, starting at 11 a.m. This is a great opportunity to bring your family and friends out for a walk or a run around the lake with community members. Food and beverages will be provided upon donation. Admission fees are $15 for adults, 10 for students, and children 12 and under are by donation. A portion of the proceeds will be going to local charities in Nanaimo. You can find us on our Facebook page at Run Your Way Into Spring Westwood 5K. We hope to see you there. Some good news, 
Thanks for listening to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY Radio. For more information, questions, or comments, please visit our Facebook page at A Sound Constitution. Tune in again next Thursday morning from 10 to 11. Stay healthy, Vancouver Island. Welcome to A Sound Constitution.